Thank you. <clears throat> Welcome, everybody. Uh, today is uh, our second webinar uh, as part of uh, the Volcanic Systems uh, uh, Modeling Collaboratory work Workshop. Um, I'll briefly uh, reintroduce uh, the MCS and the background for those who uh, were not present on Tuesday. Um, so <clears throat> these, this workshop is uh, ultimately part of the SC4D Science Community Initiative, um, whose goal is, uh, sorry, I have some logistical difficulties here, uh, whose goal is to investigate the processes that underlie subduction zone hazards um, and to identify uh, a vision uh, for this initiative. And uh, there was a initial vision document coming out of uh, a workshop in Boise, uh, which suggested a mo modeling collaboratory for subduction as a key component of this uh, broader SC4D initiative. <clears throat> and this, uh, so the MCS, the Modeling Collaboratory for Subduction at this point is an NSF funded research collaboration network, RCN, whose main goal is to define a vision and pave the way for a modeling collaboratory for subduction through these workshops. There have been two workshops already, uh, one in 2000, May 2019 uh, at the University of Minnesota on fluid transport, a second one in October 2019 at the University of Oregon, that's the Megathrust workshop, and then there was going to be uh, last July uh, this Volcanic Systems Workshop in Portland, uh, which of course had to be canceled and is now via Zoom. And oops, I needed to update this. So on Tuesday, uh, we, well, no, sorry. Um, so Tuesday, today, and the planning meeting on Friday are about crustal scale magma transport. We already had two webinars in September last year on eruption plumes, and there will be uh, six more webinars, three more themes, one on magma storage in February, one on eruptive magma ascent in March, and then uh, on integrative volcano modeling and forecasting in May. Um, so, <clears throat> This is what needed to be updated, I apologize. So Tuesday was Tom Sisson and George Bergans. They presented uh, and kicked off this workshop. Uh, today, uh, we have two more science-focused presentations, one by Matt Pritchard and one by Matt Jackson. On Friday, we will have a planning meeting. Anybody is welcome to join the planning meeting. Uh, if you are interested to join it, you uh, need to register uh, through the uh, MCS website, the same place essentially where you registered for this webinar. Um, the planning meeting will be kicked off by a few short presentations by Tobias Fischer on Converse, uh, Terry Plank on the uh, modeling drivers, uh, magmatic drivers for eruption um, interest group of the SC4D. Um, and by Torsten Becker on the MCS, um, followed by breakout sessions uh, aimed at defining a vision for the MCS, um, both in terms of science objectives and practical aspects of what an MCS should look like. Um, so again, anybody is welcome to join on Friday. Uh, please, if you are interested, please sign up. And with that, uh, I will give it to Kyle. All right, so our first presentation today is by Matt Pritchard. Uh, Matt earned his PhD from Caltech and he's currently a professor at Cornell University. 
Uh, among many other projects, Matt has extensively studied deformation of the Earth's surface due to earthquakes, glaciers, uh, human processes, and of course, volcanoes. Uh, he studies magma sent in storage by combining observations, uh, often from remote sensing platforms, with theoretical models, and his work has included regional and global compilations of deforming volcanoes, as well as studies to better characterize eruption precursors. Uh, today, Matt's going to be presenting Advancing Geophysical Models of Crustal Scale Magma Transport, Comparing Techniques, Volcanoes, and Inversion Strategies. Matt? All right, can you guys all see that okay? Yes, Kyle? Yeah, great, great. That's well, good. Thank Thanks, Kyle and Helga and everybody um, involved for um, organizing this series of webinars. If, uh, you guys, Tom and George did a great job uh, starting us off on Tuesday. And so the Matt Squareds will try to help uh, keep the, the dream alive for the MCS. So today I'm going to talk a little bit from a, a different perspective than Tom and George talked on Tuesday, more from a geophysical perspective of uh, understanding what crustal scale magma transport might, might look like. And my perspective is really um, based on work um, summarized sort of in this paper we wrote with uh, Trish Gregg and others that are part of this Plutons project focusing on the Altiplano Puna um, deformation anomalies uh, around Uterunco Volcano. Um, and I've just listed a few of the collaborators here. It's involved a lot of people over 50, um, but uh, project is still ongoing and, and here are some of the people, uh, students at Cornell and collaborators in the United Kingdom and, and elsewhere. Um, and I'll try to make the point today that uh, we really, I feel like have, if we've learned anything, it's been because we've had sort of a, a good uh, discussion across disciplines. And I would love to see uh, an MCS collaboratory sort of continue that cross-disciplinary discussion with people talking uh, across different um, geophysical disciplines, uh, across all different people who study volcano science, as well as studying across different volcanoes. I think there's a real opportunity um, for us to do that. Just as in terms of the big picture questions, um, I feel like, you know, from a geophysical perspective, we're really trying to understand um, how the system is operating under the current time period. But of course, that um, tells us something about the integrated history of the volcano. So, you know, over the course of uh, millions, tens of millions of years, in some cases, um, we have a, a, a tra magma transport system that's built up, and our goal in geophysics is to really to try to understand um, what the system looks like today in terms of where um, magmatic fluids might be throughout the system, what levels, how much fluid. Um, I think a really interesting question is the question of the existence and importance of a shallow chamber. Um, Alan Gleisner has made uh, had some good questions at a symposium that I actually organized a couple of weeks ago with John Blundy. Um, where there was a great discussion about, you know, in a cartoon model that we often have, how often do we see these magma chambers, these shallow magma chambers? And, um, you know, from geophysics, it's, it's been very rare. And, and what is the implications for that for understanding the whole magmatic transport system? And I thought Tom gave a, you know, a very uh, interesting summary figure in his talk on Tuesday that, that didn't really have a, a shallow system as it's sometimes drawn. And, and the question really is, what do we see with geophysics in different volcanic systems? Uh, you know, the existence of these shallow systems, what's the role of uh, the hot zone below many of these systems, um, and how are the fluids moving? And, and that's sort of the overarching goal that we try to do uh, with various geophysical techniques. And I, as I'll try to make the point today, there's not a single tool that we should use. We should, we need to use a bunch of them. All right, uh, one thing I, I wanted to go a little off script and just ask a question, uh, considering the, the spectacular audience that has assembled uh, to discuss this problem, um, you know, I'm very curious to hear feedback from anybody, if anybody wants to write a comment in the comment box or in the Q&A section, about what lessons you've learned studying volcanoes as part of a multidisciplinary project. And let me just give you my perspective. And uh, I really love having these Zoom uh, sessions where we can have 200, 300 people involved, um, but I really miss the informal discussions. Uh, I'm showing a picture here from uh, an IAVC uh, 2013 cruise in Kagoshima Bay. Maybe a few of you were there. Uh, on this call where um, it was a very informal session. Uh, we were really stuck on a boat together and I heard a lot of candid comments about uh, the talks that people had just seen at the meeting, which I thought were really illustrative to me about working on multidisciplinary projects and how oftentimes there's just a, a failure to communicate or really understand what each other are doing. And so I think efforts like this, this collaboratory, things like the CIDR project, 
um, over the years have really helped us uh, to advance this. And so I'm interested in hearing what quotes you heard. I, I heard some interesting things. Somebody came up to me on that boat and told me the problem with my talk was that I believed the seismologists. And uh, as somebody who did a different technique, um, that, that their technique was more reliable. Or I hear other people tell me that I shouldn't believe other people's results on the project because of course they're geophysical and they're non-unique or their technique is a black art. Um, or sometimes I just hear people say, you know, geophysics always finds a red blob from below a volcano. Uh, what does that really tell us? And so I'm hoping that a goal, for, in my mind, one goal of an MCS is to sort of address these types of, of problems and these comments. These are sort of, I feel like, um, people's deep feeling they don't always reveal. Um, and so you need a, an informal setting to try to, to get past those and start to talk about really what can we trust about individual models? Um, what does a red blob really tell us? And are there some volcanoes that don't have red blobs? And um, do the red blobs from different geophysical techniques show up in the same place? And so I really see an opportunity um, you know, for us to you know, work together across disciplines to address these problems as opposed to, um, I think a lot of these quotes are sort of revealing a more parochial interest of, you know, my discipline has all the answers. Um, and I'd like to see us move beyond that with this sort of collaboratory. So I'll try to give you a couple of uh, lessons that um, have come to me over the years as we've uh, tried to use geophysical techniques to find magmatic fluids in the crust. So one, I'll talk a little bit about using the right geophysical tool to answer the question that's being posed and give you an example, uh, not from my work, but from others who have worked uh, drilling into Krafla in Iceland. Again, not a subduction zone. I guess that, that's another meta point I wanna make uh, today, which is I love the subduction zone 4D uh, uh, idea. I, I just would like to make sure that we realize that volcanoes happen in a lot of settings and we can learn lessons um, in, in a collaboratory setting uh, from modeling in rift settings and in uh, hotspot settings and, and other settings. Talk a little also today about um, the need for multiple geophysical techniques to really understand um, that it might give us different pictures of what's happening in the surface, but we can interpret them um, by merging them together with an understanding of what the petrology is telling us. Um, I also will want to make the point that there's value in comparing uh, different volcanoes. I'll, I'll dig in deeply to the Altiplano Puna system, um, but I'll try to highlight just, you know, there are great data sets coming from a variety of volcanoes around the world. And wouldn't it be great if we all got together and, and tried to synthesize that understanding. Um, and, and, and to that point there, I think this really is an exciting time for a volcano uh, collaboratory. Um, you know, my discussion of modeling in this uh, talk is really thinking about building a petrophysical model that explains uh, geophysical data sets. And there's a variety of geophysical data sets, including um, uh, gas emissions and thermal emissions that come out of volcanoes that uh, we also need to reconcile with our picture. All right, so uh, let me just start off with um, an example of talking about different geophysical techniques. So some people know that um, there was a drilling project at Krofla, um a few years back that was surprisingly found magma they intersected with a drill hole at two kilometers depth, while the geophysical techniques um, saw anomalies that were much deeper. And so this sometimes comes up to, to people talk to me about, oh, well, you know, what can geophysical really resolve? What can we, you know, we can really test things by drilling. I'm, I'm a big proponent of drilling into magmatic systems um, to test our knowledge and to test our inversions. Um, but does this tell us something that, you know, geophysics is blind to certain types of magma? And I guess I would say, well, I, I wouldn't lump geophysics into a single uh, uh, tool bag. You know, I, I think just like any sort of way that we study volcanoes with different isotopic systems or different elements, each one can tell us a different part of the story. And the same thing is true with geophysics. So these, this is an image here showing these various drill holes. This is showing one that, that encountered magma. And these anomalies are showing where the magnetotelluric studies indicated where there would be magma, and they did not seem to show magma where the, it was drilled into. But if you use a different geophysical technique, for example, um, if you're going to go drill for oil or gas, you would use reflection seismology. Well, we don't have reflection seismology per se at Krafla, but there is uh, a bunch of earthquakes that occur there that can be used to simulate uh, where there might be reflections. And if you do that sort of analysis, which is usually higher resolution, you could actually find magma in the spot where it was encountered by the drill hole. So I guess my, my, my point is here, sometimes I see um, comments where all geophysics is lumped together and 
you know, we just need to understand that there are a bunch of different tools in the tool tray and that we need to understand um, uh, which, what our tool can and cannot see. And for example, if we're trying to drill into a shallow reservoir, we should use the tool that's used in oil exploration um, as opposed to a tool that maybe doesn't have the right resolution to be able to detect it. All right, so the other sort of illustrative example I wanted to make is when we sort of have multiple techniques at a given magmatic system, each technique is telling us a slightly different part of the story and we're going to need to find a way through a model to synthesize all of those different um, disparate data sets together to try to understand what the subsurface is really looking like. So in this example, we'll be talking about the Plutons project focused uh, in the central Andes, where we've used a variety of geodetic ground deformation data sets, as well as seismic, as well as electromagnetic, as well as gravity. Um, so just to give you a sense, the central Andes uh, was talked a little bit about um, earlier this week. Um, it was the site of a, an ignimbrite flare-up. Um, you know, Sean De Silva was part of the Plutons project to help us understand how this uh, project related to these eruptions that happened in the very shallow magmatic systems. Um, but over the course of the last 10 million years, here's an estimate of sort of the amount of volume that was erupted in this area. And here is a, a geophysical image from Kevin Ward showing the um, shear wave velocities at about 15 kilometers that show there's an overlap of this Altiplano Puna volcanic complex uh, that had this ignimbrite flare up and the Altiplano Puna magma body that was known to have a large amount of crustal melt in the mid crust. But one, but one of the things that brought us to this particular area was the fact that, that this was an area that was actually deforming, that there, we thought that there was actually uh, fluids moving within the crust currently, and that these fluids are probably quite deep. So this is showing you some uh, time series of interferograms that's showing ground deformation, showing this uh, unusual sombrero pattern that shows uplift uh, about 70 kilometers across of about a centimeter per year at the maximum rate and then a moat of subsidence uh, around that uplift um, showing uh, of, of a few uh, millimeters per year. All right, so this was sort of a line, this Altiplano Puna volcanic complex, the Altiplano Puna magma body, this ground deformation sort of brought us to bear a whole slew of geophysical techniques to try to happen what was in the subsurface. So again, here's a Kevin Ward um, figure that sort of shows what I call the, the giant flying saucer this was using ambient noise tomography, showing this large zone 200 uh, kilometers across, uh, maybe 10, 15 kilometers thick in various places, uh, zone of partial melts, perhaps up to uh, 25% um, with the lowest uh, shear wave velocities. But the question is, okay, so this, this sort of has this geometry, but um, given the, the resolution of this technique, um, it couldn't really resolve smaller scale features, try to understand conduits that might come from this area to the surface. Let me also just mention that another, I think, important part of uh, a collaboratory going forward is trying to link um, experimental results with these geophysical methods. So tip to currently what we often do at different volcanic systems is we do an inversion, we get a shear wave or P wave velocity, and then we use an, a relationship like this um, to try to estimate how much partial melt might be related to that uh, velocity anomaly. So here's just showing you examples from Yellowstone, and from the Altiplano Puna magma body, this is where that number of something of a bulk average on the order of 25 to 30% um, has come from. So that was one technique, a, a seismic ambient noise tomography image. Um, another technique that we could use is magnetotelluric imaging. We're using electromagnetic currents in the earth to try to image areas that are more or less electrically conductive or resistive. Um, and this is sh showing you a, a plot uh, from Martin Unsworth, Matthew Como and others, showing you that, that again, there's a, uh, at the depths of where the seismically resolved feature was approximately, um, there was a large scale uh, low resistivity zone, uh, could be related again to partial melts. And there's also a shallower low resistivity zone. And so this is where I think uh, a, a real interesting discussion happened of what is this low resistivity um, zone. And I think it was clear from the petrology that John uh, Blundy and Duncan Muir had done that we have uh, primarily dacitic magmas coming out of Uterunku with some andesitic enclaves. And um, based on the, the geobarometers there, the shallower zone was thought to be related to the dacite, deeper zone related to the andesite. 
given the volatile contents, the composition, the potential temperatures that those uh, materials had in the subsurface, we could then go to uh, a model that tells us how, what the resistivity of that particular zone might have been. And so in the shallower zone that was thought to be day site, given this uh, silica content, this water content, sodium content and temperature, we know that this day site is very resistive. And so to actually get to the observed uh, level of resistivity, we would have to have almost 100% melt to be able to get that low of a resistivity, which we did not think was plausible, especially since this volcano has not erupted in um, about 250,000 years. And so instead, our interpretation at the current moment is that this is some zone of shallow brines. So a brine would have a very low conductivity and, and with plausible numbers, we can explain what that might be. And um, another option is that it could be related to uh, a sulfide deposit. And that's, that's something that we're currently still investigating with additional uh, observations. While on the deeper level, uh, the andesitic level with sort of uh, this amount of silica, water, sodium, and temperature, the observed resistivity could be explained with, depending on how the melt was interconnected, um, sort of a range of melt properties sort of in the range of, you know, maybe uh, as low as 20%, uh, but maybe a little bit higher. Um, but this would have a much higher water content than the shallower zones. And this is where there's been a, a paper uh, written about uh, potentially you know, a Great Lake size water volume in that area. So that is sort of a value of combining petrology and modeling and lab experiments and the geophysical observations. But an important uh, parameter that needs to be considered is that was just considering the conductivity. If we directly compare the conductivity to the resistivity, we get slightly different depths to these large scale red blobs. Um, so the conductivity one turned out to be uh, sort of at this level, a little bit deeper than the seismically inferred um, low velocity zone compared to the low resistivity zone. And so we had a lot of discussions back and forth because certainly these are from geophysical inversions. It's not always clear um, what factors are affecting those inversions. We did a lot of sensitivity tests. We, for example, found that the three-dimensional inversions for the MT data were very important compared to the 2D uh, um, inversions. And so after we sort of resolved all of those different things, we sort of came to an understanding that these different geophysical data sets are telling us sensitive to different things in the subsurface. And so we sort of developed this sort of a model that's showing here the, the seismic velocities here, showing you that this here's the zone of low velocities um, sort of in this range, the top of the range where you sort of might have to require some sort of partial melt might be at something like um, uh, seven or eight degrees, uh, kilometers below sea level, um, and that's sort of 12 kilometers uh, below the surface of the earth here uh, on the Altiplano. While the minimum in terms of the, uh, the, re the resistivity structure was a little bit deeper, maybe on the order of 13, 14 kilometers below sea level, um, or on the order of uh, 18 or 19 kilometers below the surface. And the idea again here is that these different geophysical data sets are sensing partial melt, but they has different resistivities and different seismic velocities. So for example, in the shallower part, um, if there's a day site or melted country rock on top of the andesite, that might be a little bit more resistive, uh, resistive um, while it still is partially molten. So it might have a low seismic velocity, but not as low of a resistivity until we get into more of the andesitic composition where we still have a low seismic velocity um, but we have a much lower resistivity. While in the shallower zone, um, as I said, there's sort of a hydrothermal system that also has a very low resistivity and, and possibly related to brines. So that is two techniques. That is comparing um, ambient noise tomography with uh, magnetotellurics, but there are other techniques that also help to fill in different aspects of the, of the picture that was happening in the subsurface. So here's an example of using a gravity data and a gravity inversion showing sort of uh, what are sometimes called the fingers that come up off of the Altiplano Puna magma body, often uh, overlying some of the features that we saw in the magnetotelluric data. Um, we also use a different uh, type of tomography called earthquake tomography, where we're using earthquakes that occur um, along the subducting Nazca plate, as well as earthquakes that happen in the crust or shallow, um, shallower parts of the crust. 
to try to look at crossing rays to find out what the P wave and S wave velocities in the subsurface are. And uh, so we just focus in on this area that was sort of well resolved. And we observe a structure that looks a little bit different than the, the giant flying saucer I told you about before from these um, sort of uh, earthquake tomography models. Again, they're more sensitive to um, structures that uh, are very different from the ambient uh, conditions of the surrounding. So we have this low velocity zone like the Altiplano Puna magma body. Um, it can be sort of difficult to see with this type of technique, but we can sort of observe something more like a transcrustal um, magmatic system that extends from the lower crust up, up into the upper crust uh, that we can resolve with this technique that wasn't resolvable with the, the lower resolution ambient noise tomography. And we can also see that here from the VPVS ratios as well, this sort of vertical structure uh, that's on top of the, the longer, uh, the, the sort of sill-like structure that, that is 200 kilometers in diameter. And I think another question I wanted to address was, uh, I think Tom brought up a, a, a very interesting discussion on Tuesday about cumulants. And where could we see, for example, evidence of cumulants or evidence of delamination or dripping off the bottom of the crust? Well, here is an example where we, there's something unusual at the bottom of the crust in the Altiplano region. And this is shown from a different type of seismic uh, study, which is based on receiver functions, where we can see that this is a, just sort of a cross section through the area showing that you know the regional moho is thought to be what this red reflector is here is sort of around 65 70 kilometers uh, regionally but below the altiplano puna magma uh, body that we're, we're talking about um, at udurunku it seems to shallow and so this is thought to be some sort of reflector possibly related to a, a plexus of cumulates or sills that are in the lower crust showing you uh, this reflector that sort of within the mid-crust indicating some sort of delamination or um, this plexus of mafic materials that, um, that could be the cumulates uh, from this large scale mid-crustal partial melting. And this is just showing you in map view sort of where this um, thinning zone is located uh, relative to the APMB. So overall, in, in summary, um, you know, I think what we learned through doing this project was that as expected, each of the different geophysical methods, whether it be ambient noise tomography or earthquake tomography or magnetotellurics or gravity um, or receiver functions tell us a slightly different part of the story in terms of trying to understand um, the role of melts throughout the entire crustal column. All right, so let me just uh, also talk about, this is an example from a single place at the Altiplano Puna uh, magmatic body. But I think that there's a lot of value in thinking about uh, expanding this to understand what is unique about this particular place versus other volcanoes. And so I really liked this um, uh, study that uh, Tom started to point to on Tuesday, which was taking uh, studies from a variety of different places in Alaska and Japan to look at, in this case, the, the density of earthquakes within the crust sort of coming up with a model that seems to show a seismogenic um, halo of where the events are happening relative to a, a, a quiescent core. I would say that, you know, uh, Susie Ebmeyer a few years ago made a similar compilation um, over a, a slightly larger data set using the, the deformation sources that we observed from geodesy, um, sort of showing a slightly different picture. And again, I don't think that these, zone, these two pictures are uh, in conflict with each other. I think that they're showing us that, for example, most of the deformation sources were found uh, sort of beneath the volcanic edifice themselves. And those areas might not be um, brittly deforming and forming earthquakes. And so you can sort of still imagine the complementary location of earthquakes sort of around the edges here. But these uh, shallow magmatic uh, centers are sort of showing up a little bit better with the, um, with the ground deformation, you know, showing out to five or 10 kilometers away from the central volcanic edifice. So again, I think this is a, a, there's a value in synthesizing a variety of different magmatic systems together using not just a single technique um, to try to understand you know, how these, these different volcanic crustal magnetic systems sort of fit together. And to, just to, to highlight the point, this is showing a map of uh, places that we know to be deforming uh, from ground deformation. That's what's shown in red. Um, I sort of circled just a few of many um, uh, some of these circles have moved around, so Montserrat uh, should not be located over here. Sorry about that, Montserrat. Um, 
but just showing you that there are a variety of, you know, maybe a few dozen now detailed studies that have been done at volcanoes around the world that we, where we could have a collaboratory to sort of compare and contrast, you know, detailed multiple uh, technique approaches. All right, um, something else I wanted to just to, to, to take a quick little survey of a few of these places. So here's an example of, a, of a, an interferogram that Paul Lundgren made showing a couple of areas of, of great interest in the Southern Andes. Um, this is Laguna del Male, uh, which had a recent uh, set of studies led by Brad Singer and others showing tremendous uplift of a couple of meters over the course of the last decade. Um, there's another center that's about 60 kilometers away in Argentina, maybe um, some of you have heard of, called Demuyo, also uplifting at the rate of 20 centimeters per year over the course of the last few years. Um, also one of the world's largest geothermal areas, uh, sort of second in the world after Yellowstone, uh, also would be a potential great target. So I, I sort of, my argument is, you know, if we want to try to study where magmatic uh, fluids are moving and what a transcrustal magmatic system would be looking at, like, a lot of these areas that are deforming very rapidly and have fluids moving within them might be good targets. And Laguna de Mali has sort of proven itself to be a great target um, here's just one of several recent papers that sort of show what the plumbing system here looks like. Um, it doesn't really fall in line with either of those cartoons I showed at the beginning, um, although there is some evidence of, you know, a transcrustal magmatic system of a shallow um, sort of crustal reservoir that is currently active um, and sort of looks different than some of the uh, examples I was showing you from the Altiplano Puna magma body system before. But I, re I really think uh, an opportunity going forward for a modeling collaboratory is, you know, making these multidisciplinary studies, comparing different volcanoes, but modeling has to play a big uh, role in that as well. And so I just wanted to highlight a couple of different uh, approaches that are being used to try to do joint inversions of multiple geophysical data sets. This is, a, I think, a really interesting question that a lot of us could uh, work together to try to address. This is an example uh, from Superior Hills where there was a joint inversion of P wave um, seismology and uh, gravity to try to study um, a joint inversion through a joint inversion, how those two parameters relate. And so they uh, sort of did an inversion, um, Michele uh, Paletto and others, um, and, and found this relationship here between the, the P wave velocity and the density, sort of following uh, sort of typically expected um, relationships, but it was spatially variable. Beneath the active uh, Super Air Hills volcano, you found, um, this is showing you, um, I think, at depths of several kilometers within the system. That's sort of what's shown here in color. Underneath Super Air Hills, you had sort of a, an area that was similar density to a sort of a fossilized system, Silver Hills, further to the north, but there was very different uh, P wave velocities. And so this allows them to try to then relate that to a certain amount of partial melt. Um, sort of going from the fossilized system to the modern system. And uh, I think a key point is that this is not a type of relationship between P wave and S wave, P wave and density that you could make unless you had done a, a joint inversion. And to, to show you an example of that, um, there's a nice um, series of talks on uh, that the magneto Teller community has been doing that I've enjoyed, uh, one by Max Moorkamp, uh, for example, where he was doing an inversion of, in this case, uh, gravity and magnetotelluric uh, inversions uh, in the Western US. And he shows a similar type of parameter plot, in this case, relating resistivity to density, where over the Western US, you, if you do separate inversions, you don't record any sort of relationship between these two parameters. So if you do sort of the independent inversions like I was showing throughout for the uh, Altiplano Puna magma body, um, you're not finding any sort of relationship between these two variables. Well, if he, he does a different uh, inversion approach than what uh, Michelle did on the Super Air Hills example, in this case, this is using a joint inversion using a, a maximum information uh, criteria in the inversion. This is how he takes the same data set that sort of looked like this before, and with that added constraint, um, now finds uh, something that looks like a relationship. Uh, he calls it a dinosaur with a tail here and two legs, sort of showing you the difference density regions in the Western US related to, to resistivity, where in general, very low densities uh, correspond to very low resistivities. Again, that, that's obviously sort of related to partial melt, but there are several other uh, sort of features in here as well. And uh, I think an important point to make uh, from sort of, this is an inversion that he did at a, you know, uh, hundreds of kilometer scale, uh, different than some of the volcanic inversions we were talking about before, 
But I think an important point that, that is made is that um, by forcing your inversion to have this additional constraint, you are gaining additional information in the sense that there are parts of your model that don't just have low density and low resistivity, that, that the, the data requires you in some places to have um, low uh, resistivity, but higher density. And what does that tell you about the composition uh, of those particular areas? All right, so let me uh, sort of out of time here. And so let me try to summarize what I sort of see uh, as a vision for a modeling collaboratory from sort of a, a geophysical inversion and modeling perspective. And I think, uh, you know, in the, in the big picture, I think it's very exciting that we have modern dense geophysical data sets at uh, several different volcanoes that we can now compare. Um, there are certain volcanoes, Demuyo might be one of them. There might be other volcanoes that need to be tar have targeted observations to sort of add to our sampling. I think it's of, of course a great concern with all volcanology that we are reliant on only a few examples to try to extrapolate to the thousands of volcanoes in the world. And we need to make sure we have a good sampling. Um, I would love to see a greater linkage between uh, geothermal projects and volcano drilling and the geophysical inversions. To some extent, this happens at private companies. Um, some of that data isn't always publicly available. Um, and so I think that that is another avenue for sort of syn synergy that exists. Um, but particularly thinking about subduction zones and an MCS, um, I think that there's a lot of work that we could be done in terms of comparing models at different volcanoes. Um, there is a tool that already exists through IRIS where uh, Earth models on sort of the whole Earth scale are compared. And wouldn't it be great if we did something along those lines to compare our models at different volcanoes or at the same volcano? I believe that there's lots of uh, room for growth in terms of thinking about algorithms for joint inversions. Um, using uh, sort of mutual information, cross gradients or other approaches to couple the different types of data sets. A lot of research needed to be done to, to understand how to do that the best. And I think there's a great, uh, again, opportunity for linking these types of geophysical inversions with petrophysics, um, trying to understand what the different uh, inverted parameters tell us about um, the amount of partial melt, the composition, um, and other parameters. Uh, and again, there's a, a great room for linking with petrology and lab experiments and numerical modeling to try to make that happen. So let me stop there and take whatever questions you have. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Matt. That was uh, fantastic. Um, you can ask questions or provide comments uh, using your Q&A uh, that Q&A tool at, that should be at the bottom at your screen. Um, we'll answer questions in sequence and we will unmute you so you have an opportunity to follow up and engage. Uh, and of course, uh, if you have questions to any of the other speakers uh, who are all on the panel, please uh, feel free to do so. <clears throat> So while we wait for more questions, we have a comment from uh, Paul Segal who says, we need to encourage the seismological community to do joint inversion of ambient noise, local earthquake, tomography, teleseismic, et cetera. So did you have more comments on the, the need for joint, more joint inversions? And joint inversion is a great, I mean, again, I think it's a great opportunity for this sort of collaboratory because it's not a, um, it's not necessarily going to be a one size fit all solution and there's going to be a lot of learning that's going to have to happen as we approach you know I showed you a couple of examples that were you know gravity with p wave seismology and gravity with uh, electromagnetic methods and I think that there's um, you know we have to walk before we can run in terms of you know exploring those one and onesies and twosies uh, of data sets together to try to understand um, you know, what's the best approach. Yeah, um, thank you, Matt. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, add to your comments that even in seismology alone, we have different measurement types that are inverted separately. And effectively, it should be in, in essence a simpler problem because you're still uh, accessing the, the wave speed or maybe the impedance contrast uh, from different types of observables, but I see no reason why these shouldn't be jointly inverted. And it seems like a real opportunity. And for, for reasons that I don't fully understand, this, this seems to be very slow in developing.
Yeah, no problem. I completely agree. Uh, we have a question from Leif uh, Kallström. Uh, looking at published geophysical imaging under active stratovolcanoes, there is a significant fraction of cases where ground deformation and seismic tomography at the same volcano do not agree. For instance, position, depth, or reservoir. Lack of joint inversions aside, I guess tomography typically is a static image, whereas ground deformation is dynamic. Different things being image. For the APMD project, how do you think this diversity in temporal as well as spatial resolution of geophysics play into your interpolation, interpretation? Yeah, that's a great question, Leif, and, and there's a lot of different answers I can imagine, so I'll try to keep it brief. <laughs> um, you know, at the, the case of the Altiplano Puna magma body, I didn't really talk about the modeling of the geodetic deformation, but let me just say again that that, that modeling is non-unique. Uh, for example, some people have modeled, um, Yuri Fialko and Jill Pierce modeled this as a uprising diapir to give you that, that unusual pattern of uplift surrounded by a mode of subsidence. Other people have modeled it as, as other, other signals at slightly different depths. And so again, the depth from geodesy is model dependent and non-unique. And so, um, you know, I think, you know, one thing that you say in your thing is that maybe we're measuring different things in terms of, you know, are we measuring melt that's happening in that andesitic body at 20 kilometers depth? Um, are we measuring something in the conduit that's above that body? Um, there's even a proposal of a paper that's coming out recently that's sort of putting the, the source of deformation even shallower and relating the pattern of uplift and subsidence to flexure. And so, you know, I, again, geodetic techniques can't always pinpoint the depth precisely. And so we are model dependent and so I think it's, it's a question of leveraging the different data sets together to say what seems reasonable. In my personal opinion at, at uh, the Altiplano Puna Magma Body, you know, the, the data set that really helped us understand what was happening there was the geomorphology, where you know, the idea that if there was a long-lived unmasked diapir rising through the crust, that sort of process should last for tens of thousands of years and should deflect the shorelines of the lakes around the volcano, but uh, John Perkins and Noah Finnegan didn't find any deflection and therefore think that any sort of uh, uplift must be shorter lived than 100 years. And so, um, again, I think that we can't answer this from a single technique. In different volcanoes, there's going to be different sources. In some cases, you might find a large uh, seismic velocity anomaly at great depth, and the deformation source might be shallower because it's related to fluids that have exhaled from that source and that come up to the brittle ductal transition and cause the uplift there. So I guess I can't give you a general answer for every case, but at least um, uh, you know, in, so, in some cases, it might be that the, they are measuring different things. In some cases, it might be that the model that's being used for the geodesy is non-unique and a different model might find a larger agreement. But again, I think this is the sort of thing that um, having a multidisciplinary discussion about would be great as part of an MCS. Right on, thanks, Matt. Uh, I, I guess maybe the, the follow-up then would be that we should probably move beyond static models. Yes, and I think, that, I think that some of the upcoming webinars are going to sort of talk about moving that state of the art. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. And then... Sorry about that. Uh, so we have a question from uh, Luca Carici. What do you think produces the shallow deformation signal commonly observed at active volcanoes? Um, that is a great question. I think, um, again, it's going to depend on the volcano. Since we have now, you know, 200 some volcanoes deforming, um, I think it depends on the magmatic system. And again, I think there's going to be more talks in these webinars coming up in the following weeks about a whole range of types of processes that are probably related uh, and occurring in different places. Some of them are going to be related to processes within the magma chamber itself. Some of them are gonna be related to injections of shallow sills or dikes. Some of them might be related to, um, you know, formation of shallow or pressurization in shallow hydrothermal systems. And so um, again, it's not always clear at different magmatic systems, what is the source of the, the deformation that's happening. And so we need to, uh, combine different techniques to try to understand is there a gravity change associated with it? Is there a degassing change or chemistry change associated with that uh, observed deformation? And so 
anyway, there's a lot of experts on this call that uh, are experts in all, in all these different sort of things. But again, I think this is, this is something that I think it's, we can make progress through some sort of discussion across disciplines because uh, as geodesists, we can't answer these questions all by ourselves. Yeah, Matt, I, I, I was referring to, I, I totally agree with you, it's impossible to have some general, um, but I will add to your multi-parametric study petrology, definitely, because I'm a petrologist, of course, but I think it's very important because it's, it's really difficult a lot of time to keep magma very hot at the depth where we observe the formation. So in most of the cases, we are almost forced to think about something else and alternative models. I think this is a call also to keep our mind really open and try to to think about alternative models for plumbing system perhaps in the future not the the two chamber or one chamber or whatever or and and i think this is going to be very challenging the the transcrustal systems are great i think but uh, we we need to start also moving to try to model them what they will give in terms of deformation because this is going to be much different from a lot of the models we are doing now probably Yes, no, great, thanks, Luca. And I guess I would I would just add the the additional um, data set that, that sort of newly be, more newly becoming available is looking at the time series of deformation observations. That you know, oftentimes we may have only static images, and, and looking at how deformation changes in these shallower systems can be tied into these models with a newer constraint that we didn't always have before. Question from Antonina Callahuhano. How do you think it would be best to combine the information from temporal geophysical surveys like gravity change over time with geophysical surveys aimed to capture a snapshot of spatial change? And also uh, how can we best use monitoring data effectively to give information about the system as a whole, not only the crisis? That's another great question. I'll, I'll try, to, try to just touch upon it. I think. Um, this is a question we're, we're dealing with at uh, Uturunku, among other places, is, you know, our data sets are being collected at different times. How very time variable is the gravity signal at the volcano in terms of a static picture versus the dynamic picture? Um, it's, and we're still working through and trying to resolve things like that. So I, I don't think I have uh, a, a best answer to that. But just to, just to be aware that yeah, we have to be understanding that, that, that there could be temporal changes and that you know, a tomographic image we took uh, a while back um, may not be completely relevant to the system we're seeing now. I, I think there's always this question of how much could the, the image, you know, our images of the subsurface change over the course of a few decades. I, you know, there are a few 4D studies that have been done, but, um, and some seem to show changes, but they're, they're relatively subtle. Um, on the other hand, clearly there's been you know, strong changes in gravity at Kilauea and other volcanoes that um, that that would would have an impact. And so, um, I guess uh, the first step is understanding that there could be a temporal change, and, and when you're reviewing papers or, or whatever, that 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 is something that has to be considered. And how can we understand the system as a whole, not only during a crisis? I think that you know there is progress being made on that. Again, through a lot of these studies, like that are being made at Santorini or at Mount St. Helens or at Laguna del Male. Um, you know, I wouldn't say there's a crisis at the moment, but there is definitely a lot of understanding happening through the multi-geophysical uh, approach. All right, it seems like we have time for one more question for now. Uh, so from Dennis Geist, many sections envisioned by petrologists involve a plexus of seals surrounded by accumulated mush. Are there tomographic or reflection techniques that can discern the size of melt-rich bodies and, and tell that from mush? Well, that's a great qu question, Dennis. And uh, as a non-seismologist, <laughs> I hesitate to try to answer, but um, there definitely have been seismic reflection methods that have tried to find things like, like, like sills either through high reflectivity in various, you know, either even sort of passive uh, rifting zones that are no longer active. Um, you know, I think, that, I think that there's a lot of opportunity there. I just was reading an interesting paper that came out last year about the Eiffel um, hotspot that is actually deforming. And, um, and there's a lot of geophysical imaging that exists in those places. So I, I don't know, maybe other people on the call know um, whether uh, what specifically has been done that might be relevant to that question, but I think that there is more that we can do to answer it. 
Great. Well, thank you, Matt. Um, I'll have to move on for reasons of time. As a reminder, there will be an additional Q&A at the end, in which case um, you'll have an opportunity to engage with any of the panelists. Um, our next speaker is Matt Jackson. Uh, Matt earned his PhD from the University of Liverpool, and he's currently professor and chair in geological fluid mechanics at Imperial College London. Uh, Matt investigates transport processes in heterogeneous porous geological media using a combination of field experimental and numerical techniques. Uh, he leads a very interdisciplinary group called the Novel Reservoir Monitoring, Modeling, and Simulation Group, uh, working to improve understanding of flow in subsurface reservoirs, including those holding magma, of course. Uh, he's worked on the formation architecture and dynamics of magma reservoirs and the remobilization of magmas. Uh, today, Matt will be talking about melt fraction change and magma differentiation in crustal mush reservoirs, insights from mathematical and numerical models. Matt? Okay, I shall go ahead and hopefully share my screen. So, do you see my screen? Yes, looks good. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Um, Matt 2 now, uh, picking up the baton from from Matt 1. A slight change in uh, in topic and emphasis uh, for the next half an hour or so. And um, in common with, um, with George's um, webinar on Tuesday, the kind of framing for my talk today is this idea that that magma storage in the continental crust primarily occurs in low melt fraction mushes rather than the traditional concept of the high melt fraction magma chamber. And this could be a series of kind of individual mush reservoirs separated by solid rock, or it could be this kind of transcrustal mush reservoir concept that's been sketched out here in this paper by, by Cathy Cashman a couple of years ago. And what I'm kind of interested in, in looking at is, is what the, the processes are that might change melt fraction in these mush reservoirs, that might change the bulk composition in these mush reservoirs, such that we see this um, this kind of characteristic change in composition that's exemplified by this section um, from Kohistan, where we see um, sort of refractory compositions at the base and these evolved compositions at the top. And in sort of the half an hour I've got, I just want to touch on some of the insights we can get into these processes from, from mathematical and numerical modeling. I'm going to focus on three processes uh, in particular and the first of these is maybe the one that people are most familiar with conceptually, which is the idea that we see melt fraction change in response to, to heating and cooling. So the idea is quite simple. We're going to introduce hot magma into the crust that could be derived from the, from the mantle or from some deeper reservoir within the crust, basaltic or intermediate composition magma. And as that magma cools, it's going to crystallize and the melt fraction is going to go down, but it can also transfer heat into the surrounding crust or the surrounding older mush, and it can therefore increase melt fraction and you know, we're kind of calling this process thermal rejuvenation as a mechanism to see melt fraction increases in, in mush reservoirs, as well as melt fraction decrease during cooling. And there have been a whole number of studies, numerical modeling studies, looking at the, the, the thermal consequences of intruding magma into the continental crust. The oldest one I could find was, was published in Nature back in 1974, uh, the most recent came out just last year and there are a whole bunch of studies in between those um, looking at different aspects of this problem and the physics is is relatively straightforward in these models the numerical methods are relatively straightforward and the forcing in these models the time evolution in these models comes from the addition of the new material that represents this uh, this intruded magma and in older models you know, the, the magma would be intruded as one huge batch. Um, but in more recent models, as kind of exemplified here by this example from Katrin Annan's work, we recognize that the magmatic system would build incrementally. And so we model the repetitive intrusion of numerous sills or dikes. Um, and we grow the system through time. So once we know the, the temperature distribution, we can then predict the melt fraction using experimental data. And in the example I'm going to show in just a minute, we're going to intrude basalt into the crust and the melting relation for the basalt comes from this, this uh, experimental work by, uh, uh, by Tom Sisson and co-workers. And we're going to intrude the basalt into, into crust, which has a kind of intermediate composition. This is melting data from, uh, 
from a sandstone or a meta sandstone. And we can also um, predict how the melt composition varies with melt fraction from these experimental studies. So Tom showed something similar to this in his talk on Tuesday, but we see as the melt fraction goes down, as we fractionate the basalt, so the, um, the remaining melt becomes more evolved, it becomes more silicic. And whereas for our kind of crustal composition, we see pretty much silicic melt across the range of, of melt fractions. And one thing I'm going to come back to is, of course, this is the melt composition we're looking at here. The bulk composition during melting and freezing doesn't change. In fact, we're just looking at three bulk compositions here, two different basalts and the crust. And these bulk compositions don't change um, at all during melting and cooling. So the, the kind of results you get from these models, I'm just going to show a simple 1D example. What we're looking at here is, is temperature, melt fraction, and bulk uh, composition expressed in terms of the silica content uh, as a function of depth. So we're looking at the initial condition here. This is the initial geotherm. It sits well below the solidus, so there's no melt initially present. And we're going to sort of our starting bulk um, cross composition is kind of intermediate. And I'm showing the bulk composition here for a couple of reasons. The first is it allows us to see where the sills are coming in because they have a different bulk composition. Um, and also because, as we'll sort of see, I think it's the bulk composition which is really important here and not, not just the melt composition. So if I play this little movie, what you can see is the sill intrusions. These are 100 meter thick sills being intruded. You can see the change in bulk composition reflecting these sill intrusions. You can see we get scepter of country rock, which get trapped in between different sill intrusions, which is just a function of how we're choosing to intrude the sills. The temperature spikes up, but then it cools back by conduction very rapidly. And we just see melt, you know, present transiently in the crust. We're having to warm the crust up to actually build the temperature up to be high enough to see a persistent uh, magma reservoir here. And this behavior is well known. Catherine Annan called it the incubation period. And we have to intrude if because basalt is the only source of heat we've got, we have to intrude quite a lot of basalt into the crust, even to get the, the temperature up to high enough to form a persistent magma reservoir. So now we see that we have magma present in the reservoir in between sill intrusions, but we've already intruded sort of six or seven kilometers of, of basalt here. Then we reach the active phase where we have a, a mush reservoir. We see some partial melting in the overlying crust. And this is a scepter of crust that's got trapped in between the basalt intrusions. We're going to intrude eight kilometers of basalt in total. That's going to give us around about four kilometers of mush reservoir. And then we stop intruding basalt and the system dies away. So that whole model ran for about 1.5 million years. And we saw a mush reservoir present for about half a million years. OK, so. So what kind of things can we learn from these models? Well, the first is that we need to intrude, if, because basalt is the only heat source we've got, we need to in, intrude a lot of basalt to create and sustain a large long-lived reservoir. So we saw a mush reservoir there that was alive for about half a million years. In, in Tom's talk on, on Tuesday, we talked about magmatic systems that were persistent for, for several million years, up to tens of, or up to 10 million years. And we're gonna to have to put a lot of basalt in to keep that system hot for that kind of period of time. And the second thing is that the metal fractions we saw there were all pretty low. OK, so maybe that's consistent with the mush concept. But if we want to produce high melt fractions, we really have to in increase the, the rate of magma intrusion. And again, this has been known about for quite a while. This is something that Catherine Annan looked at. So here from her modeling, she plotted the eruptable portion of, of magma in the, in the mush reservoir against the, the, the magma flux coming in. And you see that you have to really turn up the dial and get the basalt coming in at quite high rates to start to build up a significant fraction of eruptable magma um, within the overall mush reservoir. So that's kind of the first point. Now, the second point is about composition change. So we know that the melt composition is going to change in response to melting. But if we, if we want to actually differentiate here, we need to separate that melt out. Um, from the crystals. Okay, the melt composition is not the same as the bulk composition. We're only going to get that evolved bulk composition through separation, through segregation of melt from crystals. And in, in, in purely thermal models, there tends to be a relatively simple approach to doing this. So we assume that there's no separation at all until we reach some critical melt fraction, and then we assume that separation is very efficient. And the crystals are moved away and we're just left with this evolved melt, which now becomes a magma, which can move somewhere else in the system. 
And you can see that in, in Katerine's results here, she talks about mobile magma and the mush plus the mobile magma. And essentially what we mean here by mobile magma is magma which has a melt fraction greater than some threshold, which is typically something like 0.4 uh, or 0.5. And I think that that's missing out some of the really important physics, as we'll talk about um, a bit later on in the talk, that we really need to consider how we're going to separate the melt from the crystals and what consequences that can have for mush dynamics and, and compositional evolution. So kind of insights from thermal models. Well, first of all, we have this observation that we need very large volumes and fluxes of basalt to create and sustain a large tran transcrustal reservoir and, and to get melt fractions through melting alone that are high enough to produce significant volumes of eruptional magma. And I guess one comment here would be that maybe we're missing a trick in assuming that all the heat comes in here only by the intrusion of magma. If you look at comparable studies in the metamorphic community where they look at the heat source for very long period metamorphic events, they don't assume that comes from magma. They're looking much more at, at, at uh, mantle thermal anomalies and conductive transport of heat into the crust from the mantle over millions to tens of millions of years. And maybe that's something we should also be looking at in magmatic systems. And I guess the other thing is that we have these sorts of, of, of conceptual pictures of, of, of mush reservoirs where the mush is present all the time everywhere. And I think in actual fact, we're going to see that, that long lived reservoirs are active mushes only in a time averaged way. If you look at a time average sort of image of where mush has ever been, it might look something like this. But in actual fact, at any particular time, large volumes of the system will be in fact solid or quite cold. We don't have the thermal energy to maintain the mush system everywhere all of the time. So we're going to see some significant regions of kind of inactive solid. And perhaps that's pushing us towards thinking that, in fact, cold storage of, of crystals is the norm rather than the exception. That much of the time, crystals in these mush reservoirs may be below the solidus and will need to be rejuvenated to rejoin the active mush and potentially be erupted um, from the system. So what about this, this issue of melt solid separation? And so I guess the point here would be that um, we don't need to wait for some high critical melt fraction 0.4 or 0.5 to see separation of, of melt and solid. It can start happening as soon as we have connected melt um, through the mush, either along grain boundaries or through through fractures or some other uh, connected pathways. And we have plenty of evidence. And this is an image that I mean, George was kind enough to share his presentation from Tuesday. So this is an image that George showed on in his talk on Tuesday, showing direct evidence for, for tonalytic melt here percolating through what would at the time have been an active mush reservoir. And I think this is a really important process that we need to be capturing in, um, in models. So this brings me on to sort of why another reason why melt fraction might change in, in a crystal mush reservoir. And I want to talk a bit about, about compaction. And the first point I want to make here is that the compaction is a, is a very, is a process which is observed in numerous different natural and engineered systems. So here's an example of, of, of soils which have been compacted by driving a heavy vehicle over them. This is damage to, uh, to an old building in Holland. And I'm going to say allegedly, because just in case there are any legit, litigious shell lawyers um, listening to this presentation, um, this, is, a, this is, is allegedly caused by compaction and, and uh, subsidence in the large gas field in Holland uh, due to the offtake of gas. This is a filter press, so used to separate solids um, from liquids in the slurry, and the, the slurry is pumped through, and we have a, we have filter sheets which separate out the solids and turn them into a filter cake and allow the clean um, separated liquid to leave. And if you're drinking a coffee right now, listening to this talk, you did some compaction if you used a cafetiere, because you started off with a mixture of um, of coffee grounds and liquid, and you separated those out by pushing down the plunger and you change the, the liquid fraction by doing that, and that's an example of compaction. And again, this is a snapshot from, from George's talk on, uh, on Tuesday, showing some of the nice modeling results from his Eulerian Lagrangian models. And again, we see decompaction and compaction occurring dynamically here. We see decompaction in portions of the, of the model where we've got flow pushing the crystals apart, and we see compaction as those crystals settle back down again, and the, melt, and the, 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 the liquid fraction decreases. So in the most general sense, compaction and its opposite decompaction 
is the general process of liquid fraction decrease or increase in the case of compact of decompaction with no component exchange, no mass exchange between liquid and solid phases. And we're going to see kind of how that ties in with some, some mathematical modeling a bit later on. But it's clear that in many of these systems, we're not going to see any components exchange. You know, we don't see component exchange between soils saturated with air or water, uh, or in most oil or gas reservoirs, or in the filter presses. But we are going to look in a little bit about what happens when we, when we do deal with, with reactive systems. Now, that's a kind of a general definition of compaction that applies across these various engineering and, and natural examples. In magmatic systems, we've ended up with a much narrower kind of view or definition of compaction, which is sort of synonymous with, a, with what I call an in inverted commas, a sort of McKenzie process for compaction, which is that we have this upwards flow of buoyant melt and associated deformation of the solid matrix. And I think the point I'd want to make here is that in fact, compaction is a much more general process than this, and it's extremely difficult to model. So as George pointed out on Tuesday, and as you know, anyone who's heard him um, give talks over the past few years will know this, that um, dealing with these granular materials is extremely challenging. The constitutive relationships for these materials depend strongly on the microstructure, the rates at which we're, we're moving things around or in which we're trying to change uh, liquid fraction, scale, direction. And so it's very difficult to come up with models that can capture all of these different aspects of the complex behavior of, of, uh, of granular materials. And just to give you a quick example of how counterintuitively granular materials can, can behave, if you've ever walked across um, a wet beach after the tide's just gone out, and you stand on the sand, you see that the sand actually dries out around your foot. Now, if we follow this very simple kind of McKenzie type compaction, surely if your foot's pressing down on the solid matrix, you should squeeze out the seawater and the sand should get wetter around your foot, not drier. And what's actually happening here is that as you stand on the sand, you're inducing a shear movement, which is rotating and moving the grain slightly in the sand, which in fact is dilating the pore space. We're seeing shear dilatancy here, and that's allowing the water to drain into the increased pore space, and in fact, drying out the sand around your foot. So these granular materials can behave in, a, in, in quite complex and counterintuitive ways. And I guess my point here is that understanding how melt and residual solid will separate in mush reservoirs and the consequences of that for magmatic differentiation, I think is still a, a big challenge for, for modelers and integrating that with petrological and geochemical and, and geophysical data. Now we've talked about melt fraction change through compaction. What about composition change? And in fact, composition change in, in purely compacting systems is just simple mixing. That kind of makes sense if you imagine we're dealing with a a simple sand water system. Um, if, it's, if it's fully liquid, we just have water present. If it's fully solid, we just have sand present. And is, as we mix water and sand in different proportions, we vary the liquid fraction. So we're going to vary the bulk composition um, in a proportionate way. It's kind of a little bit more interesting though, if we now think about compacting a system where we've got some evolved residue in, in a crystal phase, um, and we've got some silicic melt. If we want to evolve the composition towards this evolved residue, the only way we can do that by compaction is by forcing out the melt, okay? If we leave a lot of melt behind, then we're not going to see a lot of evolution of the chemistry of the system. So one way we can do that is, is by initially by mechanical compaction. So we might have quite a loose framework of, of crystals and we can rearrange those crystals reduce the pore space and squeeze out the, the melt. And that's going to move us towards a more evolved residual um, bulk composition. But if we want to squeeze out any further melt than that, we need to do something different. So one approach might be to have what's been termed viscous compaction, where we can allow the morphology of the grains to change, maybe by some kind of diffusional processes, something like sintering that's seen in high temperature systems. We don't see this kind of behavior in low temperature systems, but we can see it in high temperature systems. And that's kind of going back to this sort of McKenzie model of, of compaction. We can deform the solid grains and reduce the, the pore space. And the big challenge here is really seeing any evidence for that in natural um, cumulant rocks. 
So Marion Holness has written about this. She published a nice paper in, in 2018, and George has talked about this. But we sort of invoke this process very commonly in, in modeling of compaction, but it's hard to see evidence for this in the rock record. So if we think that we're seeing these very evolved residual uh, um, cumulate compositions, and we think that's happening just through expelling melt through compaction, we'd expect to see maybe some, some textual evidence to support that. So the question is, do we still have further porosity reduction or do we have some other process now which forces out that melt but doesn't require the porosity to reduce anymore? So for example, we could, we could flush out the silicic melt with another fluid, maybe by gas sparging or something like that. But that doesn't really feel like it's a very common process um, given the evidence that we see um, in deep crustal sections, for example. So the last mechanism I want to talk about um, is really considering the fact that we have reactive systems um, in magma reservoirs. So the melt and the solid can react with each other as, they, as the, the melt percolates through the crystals. And I want to introduce this idea of, of reactive flow. And I'm going to do it in a risky way. Okay, so we haven't seen any equations at all in, in any of the talks that uh, in these in, in Tuesday or, or, or Thursday. And I'm, I'm always told don't ever show any equations. But I'm going to risk showing it. There's a way of explaining this, which kind of is a petrology way, but I'm not a petrologist. I don't really feel very comfortable trying to explain it that way, but I do feel more comfortable explaining it this way. So if you really are completely allergic to any kind of maths, now's the time to take a coffee or maybe do some compaction with a cafetiere, and I'll, I'll kind of click my fingers when it's time to, to tune back in. But I'm going to talk through this in words, not just maths. So what we've got here is an equation for conservation of mass, okay, conservation of melt. What we've got here is a term that tells us about the rate of change of melt fraction. This is the melt fraction here. And we have a term which tells us about melt accumulating. This is the velocity of the melt. And basically what this tells us is that if we accumulate melt faster than we lose it in a very small volume of rock, then we must accumulate melt, so the melt fraction must go up, okay? And then the final term we have here tells us it's a source term. It tells us whether we create or destroy melt, which we could do, for example, by phase change. And we're going to be exchanging, we could potentially exchange mass or volume from solid to melt or from melt to solid. And this is a completely standard way of expressing conservation of mass. And we can write down a similar equation for conservation of mass of the solid phase. Now, we're also going to now look at um, components. We're going to consider a simple binary system. We can do this for multi-components, but the math does get a, um, a little bit more gnarly then. So we're just going to assume we have two components. We can have component zero and component one. Okay, so now this is telling us about the rate of change of, of component one in the melt. So this again, this is now conserving the components. This tells us about the accumulation of component one in the melt. This is the, the melt composition here. And this is the velocity of the melt again. And again, this is a source term. So we can exchange melts between solid and liquid during um, phase change. And we can write down a similar equation for the solid phase. And again, these are completely standard conservation equations. There's nothing that should be very familiar to anyone who works in this area. And the final equation we need here is, is the lever rule. So this is just telling us that the bulk composition is the porosity weighted average of the liquid and solid compositions. Okay, so I've written down a set of very standard equations here. And what I'm going to do, well, what we did, is to get rid of these, these rather unknown, poorly constrained source terms. And what we end up with is something that looks complicated, but I'm going to talk through it. So this is the rate of change of melt fraction, which I'm interested in. And this is the rate of change of bulk composition. And we see that can be expressed in this case in terms of, of three different contributions and for the bulk composition change in, in terms of two different contributions. Now I'm going to start from the right hand end. OK, and this term here represents phase change, heating and cooling, but more generally phase change. And what it tells us is that we can get a change in the liquid composition. It's the rate of change of liquid composition and the rate of change of bulk comp uh, of the solid composition. This is component exchange between liquid and solid, which happens during phase change. And there's no velocity terms in here. So this all happens at static conditions. So completely consistent with what we talked about before. And there's no corresponding equation for the change in bulk composition. So we said right at the start that melting and Heating and cooling don't change bulk composition, and we see that expressed here um, in the maths. 
This term here is compaction. It's, it's stayed almost untouched by, by any of the, of the mathematical manipulations that we did. And it basically tells us about the accumulation of melt with no mass exchange. OK, so again, consistent with that early definition that the compaction is the change in melt fraction with no mass exchange, just by the accumulation or loss of melt. And we have a sister term to this in the expression for bulk composition, which basically tells us that we, uh, we will change bulk com composition by compaction by mixing. So we have a difference in composition of liquid and solid. And so if we accumulate melt, we're going to change the bulk composition just because we, the liquid composition has got a different composition or the liquid's got a different composition. So these two terms, uh, these terms are quite standard. They're consistent with the methods, we've, the processes we've talked about before. The last term, is different. Okay, and that tells us is that we're going to see a change in melt fraction if we have the flow of solid or the flow of liquid through a gradient in solid composition or a gradient in liquid composition. Okay, and we call this reactive flow. And similarly, we're going to see a change in bulk composition if we have the flow of solid through a gradient in, in, in solid composition and flow of liquid through a gradient in liquid composition. And the real point here, if you completely switched off to all of the maths I've talked about uh, up to this point, the real point here is that by rearranging some completely standard conservation equations, we clearly see that melt fraction and composition can change, uh, can be caused by flow, which is distinct from heating or cooling or compaction that we've talked about so far, and which have been examined and investigated in far more detail than this reactive flow um, process. Is this important? Well, I, I think it is. We're going to revisit the example that I showed you before where we inject um, um, sills into the crust and look at the response. But this time, we're not just going to look at melting and, or, and freezing. We're going to look at compaction and reactive flow as well. So initial condition again, geothermal gradient, no melt present, got this intermediate composition crust. And we can also look at um, the concentration of incompatible trace elements. So we start injecting uh, um, cells into the crust just like we did before and initially we don't see persistent melt present in the reservoir that's just what we saw previously this is the incubation period but what's different now is that we start to see bits of differentiation occurring within each of those cell intrusions so each one gets a little evolved top and a more refractory base and you can see that picked out best in the in the concentration of this incompatible trace element so we see some depletion and we see some enrichment which which reflects differentiation within each cell intrusion. Now, as we move towards the end of the incubation period, we start to move into what we call the growing phase, which is when we have melt present in the, in the reservoir in between cell intrusions. And this melt is buoyant and it starts to migrate upwards through the mush reservoir and it starts to accumulate at the top of the reservoir. So we start to build up this, this high melt fraction layer at the top of the reservoir and that has an evolved composition. So it's much more silicic um, than, than the basalt we're intruding or the crust that it was intruded into. We've accumulated silicic melt at high melt fraction at the top of this mush reservoir. We have a thick column of mush now that sits below that. And this accumulation has occurred through the combination of compaction and reactive flow. And then we stop in, introducing more basalt. Again, we introduced eight kilometers of basalt and the system cools away. So just to give you a kind of a snapshot of that, this is that this is the high melt fraction layer that sits on the top of the of this mush reservoir at low melt fraction, and it contains this this evolved composition, this silicic magma, um, which can move upwards and be intruded to form a, a pluton or, or or even be erupted. Now, just to compare that against the purely thermal model that we looked at, we don't see anything like this high melt fraction layer at the top in the purely thermal case. And we certainly don't see this, this, this evolution in the bulk composition at the top of the, of the, um, of the mush reservoir. So is, is, is that just compaction though? Or is that, is that really compaction and reactive flow? So what we're looking at here is just an individual sill. This 100 meters thick, that's the same thickness as the sills that we intruded into the model. And we're looking at the bulk composition here, three different snapshots in time. And the, the bulk composition from reaction, uh, so reactive flow and compaction is shown in red. And we, you see that we've been very effective here in depleting uh, in this portion of the sill here. 
then we've accumulated a, a, an evolved layer. In fact, we've cut off the top of the, the, the we have a very uh, sort of evolved layer at the top of the sill here. Whereas by compaction, we don't see anything like the, 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 uh, the, um, um, the formation of these much more um, refractory cumulates. And we don't see anything like the, the, the same level of enrichment uh, um, in uh, evolved components at the top of the, of the sill. So in fact, reactive flow is much more effective at driving differentiation than compaction alone. And so, I mean, maybe one reason we don't see evidence for lots of compaction in the rock record is because there hasn't been a lot of compaction. And in fact, most of the differentiation has been driven by reactive flow rather than compaction. And if we assume that we form these very refractory um, rocks just by compacting out the melt, you know, we would expect to see these extreme compaction textures. Maybe that's why they're missing. So here's a sort of a few final final comments. So I think that, that thermal uh, compaction and reaction processes are all important in driving melt fraction and composition changes um, in these crustal mush reservoirs. I think the thermal processes were reasonably on top of in terms of modeling. We might look at some other heat sources other than just bringing in hot magma. The compaction part of it is really difficult and really challenging and, and there's such a complicated range of physics that we need to deal with. So I think it's it's very unlikely that we're ever going to see models that can explicitly capture all of those processes at all scales from, from the, the, the grain or the pore scale right through to the transcrustal mush. And I think reaction, we're only really starting to, to get a handle on in terms of, of modeling. But we might not be able to sort of develop models that capture everything that's going on in mush reservoirs, but we can develop and apply models that address specific hypotheses at particular scales. And I think a really important thing that a modeling collaboratory could do would be to get lots of people in the room together that come from geochemistry, from petrology, from geophysics, to decide what these really important hypotheses are that should be tested and help to drive the development of models that would test those hypotheses. And one other thing we can try and do is maybe try and, and look at some hierarchical modeling. So we have different tools, different modeling approaches. And not, they're not always appropriate across all scales. So, for example, George shows these great examples of his uh, Eulerian Lagrangian models where you explicitly look at the crystals moving around and you can model, you know, several million crystals. There are trillions and trillions and trillions of crystals in this whole um, this, this transcrustal mush. So we can't apply those methods at that scale, but maybe what we can do is to apply them at smaller scales and derive effective properties that could be used in larger scale models. And, and if you were in on the, um, the meeting on Tuesday, um, uh, the question was asked, you know, can we, can we get away from using, so to Tobias Keller asked the question, can we get away from using continuum approaches? And I think the answer is almost certainly no for these large scale models, but they could be informed by these, these more detailed um, uh, models at smaller length scales. That, that's a common approach called upscaling that we could try and apply here in magmatic systems. And the final comment I'd make, well, not quite the final one, is that again, I haven't said anything about volatiles. That was raised on Tuesday. I haven't talked about volatiles today either, and they do make the modeling a lot more challenging. It's hard enough dealing with a two phase system where we have melt and crystals, putting a third phase in there as well, the volatile phase, makes modeling, particularly processes like compaction, um, really a lot more challenging. But we need to keep tackling that challenge because we know that the volatiles can be very important. And the final thing I would say is that we need to always come back to this observation that uh, we know that all models are wrong, but hopefully some models are useful. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matt. That was a very interesting talk. Um, again, uh, you're welcome to ask questions using your Q&A uh, tool at the bottom. And uh, I think uh, the first question for Matt Jackson was by Tobias Keller. Yeah, so first question, uh, Tobias Keller, fantastic talk. You explained really well how important it is to consider compaction and reactive flow in our magmatic models. What's still missing from this perspective of vertical segregation compaction is flow in two, three dimensions, which allows convective overturn, etc. How do you anticipate including that component to affect our understanding in the future? 
that that's a very good point, Tobias. Um, I, I think, I mean, to be fair, you know, the models that, that George has been has been um, developing and showing, they are already two D. So we see that the the complexity there that comes through from um, from looking at the system in more than one D. It's, it's true that the compaction models, the kind of the McKenzie type compaction models, certainly I've worked with and that have mostly been shown so far are, are, are 1D. There's clearly a lot of potential complexity that would come from expanding those models to 2 and 3D, both in terms of, of compaction and reactive flow. So I think, so G George showed some, some very sort of heterogeneous um, flow paths in his example from the Famotinian arc section. And we're never going to capture that kind of thing in purely 1D models. But and you can imagine in 2D there are lots of or 3D there are lots of, of strong nonlinear feedback loops that would occur between the rock texture and the flow path. So we know there's going to be a very strong control on permeability, for example, as we vary the, the, the melt fraction. There'll be strong control on the rheology as well and how easily and how the um the, the, the mush can can respond to the flow of melt. We see that in uh, in George's models. And I think it is going to be very important to try and capture that if we really want to be able to do a better job of linking model predictions with the field observations. And I think in the end, we're going to have to try and borrow some, some of the methods that are used elsewhere in other areas of computational fluid dynamics. So there's lots of interesting work going on using more advanced discretization methods, using methods where the, the mesh can adapt to flow so you can put computational effort where you need it. Um, so you can make the, the, the overall computational cost of running the model lower. So hopefully you can then move from these 1D models into 2 and, and 3D models. Thanks. Next, we have a question from Tom Sisson. Uh, so the question is, how do you reconcile the long times needed by models for differentiation versus the geologic observation that single upper crustal basaltic seals are substantially zoned? For example, the classic Palisade seal in New York and New Jersey. I, I don't think there is a um, a discrepancy there. In fact, we do see um, differentiation occurring in individual cells in the um, in the modelling that, that we do. So that differentiation can occur quite rapidly. I think for me, it would be around the volumes of 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 evolved melt and how evolved you make the melt when you differentiate within an individual cell intrusion. So we see in, in our modeling, we see that, that each individual seal will differentiate. It definitely gets easier as the system warms up. You need to have some time for that differentiation to occur before the seal will, will cool and lock up completely. And in a single seal intruded into cold crust, that cooling time can be really short, just of order of a few tens or hundreds of years. And that may not leave enough time for differentiation to occur. Um, by compaction, but I don't think that differentiation is necessarily a slow process. It just needs a few more years than that. Maybe it needs it to be a little bit warmer. And you would start to pick up that differentiation in individual sill intrusions. And then when you stack all of those sills together and you start to build a big mush body, you can actually see that melt percolating all the way through the mush from one sill to another and eventually accumulating at the top. And that process you know, might take um, a little bit longer to happen, but within each individual sill, I don't think it does necessarily have to be, uh, the differentiation doesn't have to be a very slow process. Next question is from an anonymous attendee. I'm sorry if I missed this. Is there any limit depth in which compaction is not as important uh, slash critical? or any range of depths in which certain processes are much more relevant than others? So I don't think this is so much around depth. There's around sort of properties like temperature um, and, and melt fraction and bulk composition. So we can see compaction occurring in cold, shallow systems. You know, that's that's the or even in, in, in cold industrial systems. We can see compaction occurring there. We can see it occurring in, in hot systems, which could be either shallow or they could be deep. Um, but the mechanisms by which compaction can occur will be different depending upon the temperature, the way in which the, 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 um, you're, you're reducing the pore space. So it comes back to dealing with this complex granular material behavior. When it's hot, there may be some mechanisms that become available that might relate to the ability to change the grain morphology, to have some grain sliding because you've got melt present. There might be different mechanisms you would see um, in colder systems. I don't think it's really so much with depth as to do with things like temperature, uh, melt fraction, and composition.
All right, we have another question from Roberto Merida. How do these models, along with compositional and textual observations from erupted materials, can be used on the assessment of volcanic hazards and volcanic activity forecasting? Excellent talk. Greetings from Guatemala. Wow, I, I kind of feel this is probably one for the whole panel and not just for uh, for me. Um, I think one thing here might be, I mean, we we kind of it, it, perhaps this comes back to, you know, sort of transient storage of magma beneath an edifice prior to eruption and, and how that magma gets there in, in the first place. So, you know, one thing we might be looking at here would be would be whether deeper processes within a, um, a transcrustal magmatic system might really be responsible for accumulating the magma, um, which ultimately forms a large explosive eruption. So I think the point here would be that we need to understand those processes in a quantitative way to try and actually understand, you know, the controls on the periodicity of a maybe large magnitude eruptions that would be particularly hazardous, um, because it's that it's those processes deeper in the transcrustal system that are really controlling those, rather than what happens in a in a shallow chamber immediately prior to to eruption. Thank you very much for your answer. Thank you. Um, another question from uh, Tonin B. Thank you very much for these two awesome talks. Is there a way to see previous talks? I just discovered the existence of the seminar schedule today. I guess it's more a logistic questions uh, for Elge. Yes, uh, the talks are being recorded and they will be available on the MCS Volcanic Systems Workshop webpage. Just give us a day or two to, you know, Put all that together and uh, questions to the speakers that were not answered uh, as speakers have time and uh, uh, we'll try to also provide answers to those in a document on the web page. Uh, of course, please understand, you know, written answers to these questions can be quite, take quite a bit of time. So we'll do our best, uh, or rather I should say uh, the speakers as they as time permits. So anyways, uh, all the videos will be posted on the website. Just give us a day or two. And if you go to the MCS website, uh, there is a separate page where all webinars, not just the volcanic system ones are available for viewing. Um, so in case you have, you know, interest, you're interested in some of these other talks that were given. All right, uh, one more question from uh, Boris Kals. Another potentially important mechanism is transport of melt along fault, fault zones or through dikes. Can you speculate on the relative importance of that compared to pure reactive transport or compaction? I, I completely agree, um, Boris. And, and uh, this, this may be some sort of length scale issues going on here. I, I, I don't myself believe that we see sort of reactive percolative th flow throughout the whole column of a transcrustal mush. I think that probably what's more likely is that we have portions of the mush where we are seeing reactive percolative flow along grain boundaries, but also along kind of small scale shear zones and, and all of that kind of, uh, of some of those complex melt paths that George talked about uh, on Tuesday. And then there's going to be another scale of magma transport where we see much more rapid movement of magma from, you know, one high melt fraction lens to another, perhaps within that mush zone, which is maybe kind of picked out in the schematic by these sort of vertical, um, these, these sort of vertical pipes. And I think that dikes and, and faults would play a really important role in, in driving that much more rapid and larger scale movement of magma through the through a mush, through, through maybe what could be a mush zone, rather than seeing this kind of reactive perc percolative flow occurring all the way through. So I don't think you could take a particle of melt at the bottom and follow it all the way along grain boundaries and fractures until it gets all the way to the top and it's in a granitic pluton. I think it will see very dynamically varying melt fractions. Sometimes it's going to be percolating maybe along grain boundaries, and sometimes it's going to find itself within a much higher melt fraction uh, body of magma, which could then move rapidly through a dike or, or along a, a fault zone. 
then it's going to maybe store, maybe even freezes for a while and becomes very cold and it gets reactivated by maybe some more hot material coming in and does some more percolative flow. So I think it could be a really dynamic mixture of these different types and length scales of melt transport. Hey, Matt, can, can I jump in here? Yeah, uh, go ahead, George. Just to, just to completely agree, what we've already seen, and I mentioned an example on Tuesday, is you if the frictional nature of these mush piles will allow dike-like features to form uh, under what we would normally think of as, as much too melt-rich conditions, we can see these in the field. And so the kind of variety of plumbing that, that you know, that, that's available and can emerge naturally in mushes is something we're still just discovering. And, and, it, and, it, and the more we discover, the easier it gets because the, the rheological switching can be, you know, a fascinating is poorly understood that can assist melt movement. That's it. Okay, and last question from uh, Ben Andrews. Can you describe how density differences between the melt and crystals might promote or inhibit reactive flow or even help drive the flow of melt relative to the mush? It seems like in the equations you showed today that volume was treated as equivalent to mass, but there can be substantial density differences between mineral phases and melt, and thus volume is not a conservative property. Ben, you're absolutely right. You know, I did conserve volume and not mass, and I wanted to get rid of all those nasty density terms which appear in there if I, drew, if I did genuinely conserve mass uh, rather than volume. And I absolutely agree that I think this could be a significant additional driving force to push melt out of the of the of the the, the, the mush pore space. You know, you're going to get this positive uh, volume change on melting. It's going to increase the pressure in the melt phase, and that could be an, another key driving force, a key driving pressure gradient to get the melt to flow relative to the to the solid mush. And I, and it's actually one I don't think we've really paid enough attention to. Okay, uh, well, thank you very much, uh, first and foremost, to our speakers, Matt Jackson and Matt Pritchard, as well as George Bergans and Tom Sisson on Tuesday. Uh, thank you, Christelle and Helen, for moderating the questions um, today. Just as a reminder, we will have this planning meeting tomorrow, uh, starting at 12 o'clock noon, uh, central time. Uh, if you are interested to contribute further to defining a vision for uh, a volcanic systems part of a modeling collaboratory, uh, you are welcome to participate. Please uh, register on the MCS webpage for this. Uh, the meeting tomorrow will be a regular Zoom meeting. Everybody will be able to interact uh, through breakout sessions as well as, uh, you know, everybody together. Um, thank you again and hope to see you tomorrow. And again, next month, uh, there will be another series of webinars and planning meeting to follow on uh, what we started here Tuesday and today. Thank you very much.